Hello friends, welcome again. My name is Tanvir Ritsi. We'll be discussing the second part of Indian modern art between 1920s and 1940s. In the first part of this module, we touched upon the ideas that were surfacing in Calcutta and Shantiniketan. We focused on Abhinendranath, Rabindranath, and Gagnendranath's work and discussed the revivalistic ideas and also had with and also the disagreements that Rabindranath and Gagnendranath had with the revivalistic discourse, <laughs> which was proposed by Abhinendranath Tagore with the help of E. B. Hewell, Kokazo Okakora, Sister Nivedita, and others. In this section of the lecture, we will talk about another stalwart from Calcutta. Alongside, in this section of the lecture, we'll focus on three more artists from Calcutta, namely Ram Kinkar Baj, Nandalal Bose, and Jamini Roy. Also, we'll go. Uh, also will highlight in the end some of the regional trends that were in vogue and some of the ideas that were shaping up in other parts of the country where modern art was finding its feet. The contribution of Nandalal Bose is not unknown to any, especially with the history of modern art. As a painter, he's known widely. Nandalal Bose joined Kala Bhavan in 1920. In 1921, after the World War I, Shantiniketan School was transformed into Vishwabharati University in the direction of supporting non-cooperation movement launched by Mahatma Gandhi to boycott colonial institutions. Here I would require your interest for a brief moment of time to deviate from the main topic and look at what was Indian freedom struggle doing at that time, what was Gandhi doing and where did art come in? What did art do to Indian freedom struggle? Now, this is one of the crucial things that has happened in the history of Indian art especially where directly painters like Nandalal Bose are commissioned to create murals and to express their solidarity and of course their ideas of freedom and liberation from the colonial force from the British Empire who realized Rabindranath's vision of education which he considered fitting to his own imagination and his curriculum in Vishwabharti incorporated Rabindranath's notion of creativity and non-hierarchical artistic practice at Kalabhav. In 1925, in Shanti Niketan, he arranged teacher studio and studios adjacent to each other to encourage dialogue between the teachers and also between the teachers and the students. Now, this is one of the revolutionary steps taken by a painter ever in the history of modern art in India. Where the pedagogy, the pedagogue is speaking with the apprentice, not merely from the perspective of a teacher, but there is a considerable amount of engagement, a dialogic engagement that has been intended to shape up and pave way for new ideas. This kind of intellectual emancipation and freedom was landmark in churning the ideas, in generating new ones at Kala Bhavan during 1920s. In 1928, he moved a step further. He assigned a personal mentor to each student 
to revive the Indian educational system of Guru Shishya Parampara known as Student Master Apprenticeship under a master. Now this was a major step again. Taking into account and thinking about materializing the idea of South Asian pedagogy. Perhaps asking a question, is there something called as Indian pedagogy? As we know in the in the past, artists and their apprentices, artists and their students in their studios learned through a rigorous engagement with each other where the binaries sometime, the binaries of artist and the teacher, the power structure sometime often used to blur. The workshop instead of becoming a classroom where the one would speak to the other became a dialectical space where it became a dialogic space where the give and take was mandatory. Nandlal was aware of prevailing international trends in art, but his visual and conceptual manifestation remained Indian. That's why he again and again goes back to the Ajanta, which will come to later. He studied Indian artistic tradition and techniques in depth while teaching various techniques and discussing diverse art forms of the world with the students. He gave the broader perspective of his art practice to them, which only was not, which not only was, <coughs> which not only was opening up the students to the scenario of world art and exposing them to the developments that are shaping up, that were shaping up, to the developments that were shaping up in other parts of the world, but also the ideas the innovations, the skills, the techniques that the artists of India had inherited from their predecessors from the past. As an artist, he never depicted nature in its external form, but tried to realize or capture its essence. Something very similar to post-impressionistic attitude of painting, where Paul Gauguin and Vincent van Gogh, among others, emphasized on the internal feelings of the artist while he captures the subject in his painting. Nandalal's idea of indigenity, of the nativity, was also shaped by Gandhian idea of non-cooperation, which was challenging the very structures, the very existence of colonial brutal rule in India. In 36, in 1936, Mahatma Gandhi invited Nandalal to organize the Indian Art Exhibition at Lucknow Congress. Another milestone in the history of Indian art has been laid down. Another milestone in the history of Indian art was being laid down. For the first time, a political movement was being buttressed or a political movement was being expected to find a creative way of expressing an artist's concern about the non-cooperation and about the indigenity, about the liberation, about the freedom of India. But Nandalal's simple artistic symbols Gandhi was, uh, with Nandalal's simple and art, simple artistic symbols, Gandhi, Gandhi appreciated while seeing the picture, while seeing the pictures. Gandhi highly appreciated Nandalal's simplicity of depicting artistic symbols. Also because Nandalal was successful in bringing the folk and tradition folk and traditional elements of crafts into his painting. His posters for Haripura Congress earned him a nationwide recognition. He became the epitome of artistic nationalism. In 1927, Nandalal turned to his fresco techniques 
and invited Narsinglal Mistri, a traditional fresco painter from Rajasthan. Now again, Nandalal is doing something very unusual, something, something very unique, never done before. He's mixing the idiom of contemporary with the tradition and trying to create a, create a new vocabulary of art, blurring the boundaries between the tradition and contemporary, the tradition and modernity, by inviting Narsinglal Mistri to paint with him. During his stay in Shantiniketan, Narsinglal until 19, during his stay at Shantiniketan until 1933, Narsinglal and Nandalal completed a mural with the students. Another gesture, another overt exposure, another overt gesture of modernity, an attempt to create participatory art where the students, the teacher, the traditional master are working on one surface together. Dismantling all hegemonies, dismantling all power structures, dismantling all boundaries. To get the three-dimensionality similar to Ajanta and Bhav paintings, Nandalal goes, Nandalal explored ancient titizes such as Shilparatna followed by the local craftsmen and all other mural traditions. Now here, a going back is evident. It's so overt that he cannot escape it. It's so clear that what Nandalal's attention was. He was not only taking on to the Western notions of art, but also the mediums of art. In 1930, he achieved unified expression from the diverse techniques which can be seen in his first mural on the agricultural science building based on the Italian fresco technique. And the mural he depicted, Halakarshan, all Halakarshan, plowing, the seasonal cultivation. Again, a rural subject matter is coming into coming to surface. So the Indian art at this point is going more and more in the depths of the diversity of cultures, the diversity of rural practices in India and trying to call out subjects that were until then perhaps not been seen or perhaps not been exposed in the mainstream art world. Between 1930 and 45, Nandalal produced murals in the New Delhi Secretariat and India House London. In 1938, on the invitation of Maharaja Sahaji Rao Gaikwad of Baroda, Nandalal went to Baroda to paint the murals at the Kirti Mandir of Gaikwads in Baroda. Between 1928, uh, between 1920s and 1940s, modern Indian art was in search of national identity through various paths and through various paths and ways. Bengal School had successfully developed its own practice through various sources of inspiration. These inspirations included, as we have discussed in the previous modules, Mughal, paint, uh, Mughal paintings, Rajput paintings, wash technique, oriental paintings, paintings from uh, Japan and China. The artist Gemini Roy rejected his acquired skills in academic realism to evolve a personal style to achieve individuality. Now when one thinks about the modern art of India and how rebellious the nature of artists were, were the natives of our, how rebellious the nature of artists was, that they could dispense with any kind of training to arrive at an individual style which we will see in Jamini Roy's works in order to create distinct but indigenous. He was more concerned about the folk, the traditional, the indigenous, yet contemporary. Unlike Bengal school, he identified the vitality of folk art traditions where he found quality imagination and vibrant spirit. In 1920s, he chose to use minerals and vegetable dyes 
in his palate, which were popularly used in villages. Now again, here, Swadeshi movement is finding an entry into the world of art. Chamini Roy, consciously perhaps, or unconsciously, we don't know, we are not sure about it, is refusing to use oil paints, to use watercolors, to use the acrylics, to use any medium that has been introduced by British in India and is subscribing to the traditional method as well as traditional mediums of paint. During the time, he experimented the possibilities of the theme of Santha. Now, Santha is being a community on the outskirts of Bengal are famous for their musical as well as traditional art. Santhos being a community of people on the outskirts of Bengal were considered underprivileged Jamini's decision to paint the mother and child as an extension of Bengal school with a folk traditional tinge is an attempt to redefine the binaries of mainstream and periphery. His work became more decorative by the time and retained some of the characteristics of Kaligat paintings such as oval faces and elongated eyes that ultimately became the hallmark of Jamini Roy's painting. Being a trained artist though, Roy's version of the spontaneity of Kaligat paintings reduced to calculated composition, uniform sweeping contour and linear quality. His precisely balanced design of the space freezes the spontaneity and movement per se. For the wide circulation of his paintings, Roy started a workshop of manual duplication of his paintings to reduce the price. A step that was previously only taken by Ravi Varma by setting up an oleograph press and producing and reproducing his artworks in order to make them popular also a revenue generator for the artist's sustainability that challenges the notions of masterpiece, the notions of ultra piece, the notions of originality. It questions the authenticity. It questions the original it questions the aura of an artwork. It questions the basic notions of what is original and what is duplicate. By looking at Roy's paintings, as you can see that he stands alone, both in terms of stylistics, in terms of compulsionality, not to, not to forget in terms of subject matter, but also in terms of the treatment of his work, in terms of the emotionality, in terms of the depicting the peripheral, in terms of bringing into the contemporary, the traditional, Jamini Roy's work in the history of modern art stands alone. Artist Binod Bihari Mukherjee was one of the close associates of Nandala and had a deep interest in Far Eastern and landscape painting. In 1940, he exclusively painted landscapes and rural life under the influence of Nandala and Far Eastern art though he assisted Nandala in his mural projects. Binod Bihari's approach of bold lines, flat colors and formal clarity simplified the design of murals. He managed creative tension between decoration and structural design. Students. In 1940, along with his students, he decorated the students' residence at Kalab. His monumental murals, for which he's famous, display harshness that corresponds with the theme of Indian life and the life of medieval saints and mystics. The subject inspired the lower class of the people to express their resistance against the caste system and other social issues prevalent in the Indian society. And in 1942, Vinod Vihari decorated China Bhavan followed by Hindi Bhavan in 1947. While working on these murals, he made notes of his experiments to document the success and failure of his techniques, his methods. He was an ardent believer of applying 
indigenous and especially Indian techniques of measurement instead of using typical European anatomical proportional methodology. This was a gesture, an artistic gesture, which was an open revolt, an overt demonstration of rejection of Victorian methods of painting. Unlike Nandalal and Binod Bihari, Ram Kinkar Baj, also termed one of the original proponents of modern sculpture in India, initially did not show any enthusiasm for Far Eastern art. Though he began painting other Nandalal Bose in 1920s, Bose sensed the unusual modeling ability of Nandalal. Bose sensed the unusual modeling talents in him and transferred him to the sculpture department at Kala. He was already exposed to a considerable extent to the modern art, especially the Western art, through Stella Cranwich. Besides this, other sterodans, surfaces, and Indian sculptures carved in stone also inspired him to experiment and choose and un un to experiment with his materials, to experiment with his work and choose unconventional materials like cement to get textured sculptural surfaces. His choice of materials such as liquid cement and concrete also corresponds with the roughness of the life of Santhals, which he was fond of. But Ram Chinkar very humbly stated that he chose cement and concrete because he couldn't afford bronze. He developed a radical working method by applying chunks of cement on the armature and subsequently shaping the figures by chiseling. For Ram Kinker, it was not just a technique, but essential part of expression for his subject matter. One could see his monumental sculpture in the premises of Kalabhavan at Shantiniketa to understand the rough yet magnificent, monumental yet expressive style of Ram Kinkar badge as a modern sculptor of India. Let's quickly now turn towards some of the regional trends that were shaping up in other parts of the countries in these two decades. As we saw in the previous modules, but during these decades, the art schools at Bombay, Madras, Calcutta, Lahore, Lucknow and Jaipur were established, helping the cities emerge as major centers for Indian modern art. The societies that were already established like Bombay Art Society and IFEX in Delhi, the Academy of Fine Arts at Calcutta, etc. played key roles in the promotion of modern Indian art during these two decades. In the previous module, we discussed academic realism and major academic artists. But in the 1920s, academic realism was radically different. Instead of narrative paintings, now artists preferred to depict domestic life and inspired and found inspiration from the struggle of common people, from the struggles of common people for instance, Devi Prasad Rai Chaudhary worked towards social equality and economic conditions. Let's now turn to Bombay of 1920s. As we discussed previously, that Bombay was an important colonial center for the modern art of India because of the establishment of the Bombay Art Society and the Sir JJ School of Arts, Bombay. The Britishers had already been successful in mobilizing and establishing the Victorian values of art in Bombay. Being an institute which was predominantly set up to propagate the idea of Western Eurocentric notions of art, especially the, Europe, especially the British 
academic art, Bombay achieved academic style with portraits, landscapes, still life and picture scenes as the major subjects of paintings. No major energies were noticed beyond the achievement of academic realism or naturalism one could term it also. Artists were making efforts to achieve every single small detail of the composition they were depicting or the subject that they were trying to capture. There was no attempt by the artists of Bombay to divide ancient Indian techniques or divide Indian subject matters. The naturalistic style modified with the application of free brush strokes and thick paints was in work. In watercolors, transparent layers applied to catch details of objects and highlights were left unpainted to brought to uh, were left unpainted to bring new treatment of natural light. Artists such as V. A. Mali and Amos Sataulekar produced picturesque produced picturesque subjects. Mali used unusual oblique, bold brush strokes with a realistic proficiency. Sataulekar also earned mastery over new approaches of watercolors and oil paintings by painting portraits and landscapes. Bombay based Bombay-based M. R. Archeraker, a painter, illustrator and an art teacher, was chosen to paint the session of Indian Round Table Conference in London in 1932. Before that, he earned mastery of watercolor and stressed on sketchy-like quality of painting. In 35, he was also selected by the Viceroy to record George V's Silver Jubilee celebrations in London. One could notice here one could notice here clearly that not only were British interested in propagating the idea of Western art within India, but to bring more energies to create interest among the artists of India to adopt properly the rules of academic naturalism, they sent artists abroad on commissions to paint European subjects as well as get exposed to the notions of art there where it was originally produced. Archer Aker authored a very interesting book on art called Rupa Darshan, an Indian approach to human form, in which he put Indian temple sculptures next to drawing of nude models posed as these sculptures. As a teacher, he wanted to show the students to examine how artists in India, in ancient India, utilized their knowledge of anatomy, utilized their knowledge of anatomy creatively to produce sculptures. This happened when he came back from London. In Bombay, academic sculptural tradition continued till 1920s. By the rise of professional sculptors such as Shamara Matre, B.B. Talim, B.B. Karmakar, Etc. Talim was known to depict narratives in academic realism. His sculpture of the Indian ascetic playing a musical instrument in which one can notice the anatomical accuracy with a blissful expression. Karmakar's, Karmakar moved to Royal Academy in 1920, ret returned to India after three years. He made his mark among the Maharashtra nationalists by over life sized sculptures of Chhatrapati Shivaji. So he becomes known for public commissions of heroic figures in bronze, plaster and cement sculptures before Ram Jinkar used it as a medium in his work. Similarly, the scene in Calcutta as we discussed in detail, especially in context with the Shantini case, where the cosmopolitan atmosphere was forged by Tagore's. At one side they were looking at the revivalism, on the other hand, the Ravindranath and Gaganindranath were extending their reach to internationalism and incorporating international values apart in their practices. With the, with the help of the British presidency, Madras surfaced as an important cultural centre on the landscape of India. Academic paintings of mythological themes, Indian life and picturesque scenes were already common practice of the Madras painters of 1920s. In 27, 
a major shift which we discussed in detail in the previous module took place that Devi Prasad Rai Chaudhary from Calcutta became principal of Government School of Arts and Crafts. He developed influential sculptural style in Madras. The Bengal influence affected Madras art scene through him, but not to a wider extent. He significantly contributed to Madras art scene by framing new ideologies to promote secular and humanistic expressions against religious art. For him, the religious art didn't mean anything. The monumental expressive sculpture Triumph of Labour represents this ideology of humanistic expression by showing emotional and physical strength of the human beings. Now here, the sculptor is not only attempting to transcend beyond the given norms, but also bringing forth the struggles of the common people. An overt display of the human energies are demonstrated through a sheer force of artistic for, uh, through a sheer force of artistic representation in triumph of labor, one could see. On the same path, he produced some images of mother and starving infant of Bengal famine in 1943. As is being said that he was an ardent believer in humanistic and secular approach of art, he was more inclined towards human struggles, human emotions, human energies, the sufferings. He believed in humanity as the idea of social justice. On this theme in 1930s, he produced his first figurative relief, Travancore Temple Entry Proclamation, to mark the admission of the untouchables in temples in South India by showing that expression of fear and hope. This is something very remarkable that artist is thinking about the social state. The artist is thinking about the classification, the objectification, the discrimination, and trying to represent it not in an ordinary way, in humanity. D.P.I. Chaudhary had a firm belief in humanity as the idea of social justice. On this theme, in 1930s, he produced his first figurative relief titled Travancore Temple Entry Proclamation to mark the admission of untouchables, to mark the admission of discrimination in the temples in South India by showing the expression of fear and hope on the faces of people who were deemed as lower caste and were not therefore allowed to enter the premises of a temple. Lahore as we have seen in the previous module and discussed at length that with the help of B.C. Sanya, the city of Lahore, an important cultural center during 1920s and before and after that as well, it was a vibrant center of culture, it was a vibrant center of education and literacy. But somehow it lacked a pure it lacked a rigorous cultural approach. BC Sanyal with the help of uh, other stu uh, BC Sanyal with the help of companions and students in Lahore established his studio and gave a new direction to the cultural landscape and the artistic expression of the city. Amrita Shergil and A.R. Joktai tried to find new directions to break the stiffness. Allah Baksh and Malla Ram of Amritsar acquired experience of painting stages for theatre. They became well-known stage painters in Bombay later on and attracted many young artists. The new generation of the artists like Satish Gujarat did join Mayo School of Art in 1939, but later on they withdrew and joined the Sarchi School of Art. Discussed now. To sum it up, we discussed the discourse of revivalism, the questions that were discussed, the questions that we were, that were being asked, the ideology, Rabindranath, Abhinendranath, Gagnendranath, the Calcutta group. No, no. Uh, precisely, that indicates the identity is very, very important. To sum it up, in this module, we discussed the revivalist discourse, the rejection of Bengal school ideology, Rabindranath and Gagnendranath's approach towards art, to make it a, it make the art an international. No, no, no. To sum it up, to sum up, in, 
in summation at the end in this module we discussed the revivalist discourse of Bengal school at the same time the rejection of it by Rabindranath and Gaganendranath Tagore the individuality and the search for new identity as artists practiced in various regions across the country the nationalistic fervor and the nationalistic freedom struggle that these decades were witness to and how art could play an important role when Andhalal Bose was invited to make posters for the Haripura Congress precisely to end up the decades of 1920s to 40s were very important in terms of giving a new attitude, giving a new direction, a new guideline for the artist in the pre-independent India who were struggling with the concerns of making Indian art in the genius and representing the cultural ethos of India on the international form, on the international platform. Thank you very much.